Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The house of the Lord. Sanctuary of God. A meeting place. A meeting place. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. In the book of Genesis, the Bible says that God came down daily. We've been talking about a daily relationship here in this service, whether you realize it or not. Because he's the only one who can meet our needs. He's the reason we got up this morning. He opened our eyes. He put the breath in our lungs, and he, he, he blessed us with a, a, a beautiful day to come and serve him, to acknowledge him and acknowledge his presence in our lives. Not only to do that, but to, to grow in grace. To grow in grace as he grows us up from inside out. Amen? Amen. That's how it has to work because he, he, he redeemed us by his blood. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says the life is in the blood. The Bible says that there's no life outside of Jesus. So Jesus is in the blood. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. It's a work from inside out. It's life-giving flow. Life-giving flow. In the book of Genesis, it says that, that God came down and walked with Adam on a daily, on a daily basis. Do you notice how it says that? You know, I didn't see anywhere in that section where it said God came down and walked with Adam daily that said that God didn't show up. All of a sudden, it doesn't say God didn't show up. It was man that quit showing up. It was our humanity that quit showing up for the daily meeting of God to walk with him in the cool of the day. The cool of the day implies the blessing of the Lord. Where God is, there has to be blessing. You know, to be in Christ, we've went over the principles of, of, uh, of our goal is to know God. Amen. To know God. We need to pray over somebody that's getting sick back there or something. Huh? Are they okay? Huh? Ain't screaming for help. Okay. We don't want to let nobody choke to death. Amen. First step is to know God. Second step is to find freedom. Third step is to find purpose. And the fourth step is to make a difference. That should be each and every one of our goals, to make a difference in somebody's life. Because Jesus Christ sure made a difference in our lives. He made a difference in my life. And I got a lot to celebrate because he's been good to me. Amen. I want you to, I want you to understand that, that uh, God is still present. You know, it's not just in the cool of the day that God come to walk with man because God created man to be in him and him in us. Amen. You know, when Jesus drove out the money changers in, in, in the Bible, it says that, that his statement after he drove out the money changers is the purpose of the sanctuary. The purpose 
the purpose of God through entertaining us. And he says this. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer. My house shall be a house of prayer. Not for just the Jews. He goes on to say, for all nations, for all nations, including us, that we could come into, the, into God's house, into God's sanctuary, and, and, and pray. That should be our keynote uh, responsibility is to pray, not only for ourselves, but to pray for our families, our friends, our community, our country, our, our leaders, as he instructed us to. And, and so prayer is a, is a commodity that uh, is very lacking. Amos said that uh, there's a, a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. A famine of hearing the Word of God. You know, when you pray out loud, you hear the Word of God being prayed and washing away the, the things of the world. Freddie, if you'll read first, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12. We're going to start there. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, tells you that he's always present. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Thou hast well... Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen... For I will hasten my word to perform it. Talk into that mic, Freddie. Check, 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 check. I'm not, probably not turning up the right one. Probably not. Well, I don't know. There it is. I'm good now. When you read, be bold. Everybody can hear me now? Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. I think it had to be the one. Maybe Channel this one here. What the mic says. Huh? Channel two is what the mic says. Okay, I, maybe it's this one. I'm a lot louder now. Okay. I turned both of them up. Praise the Lord. God watches over his word to perform it. So what does that mean? That means that God's going to perform everything that he said. He's going to do it. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 goes into the end of the the seals that, that Christ is going to open. You know, the book of, of Revelation starts out with the churches, starts out with, uh, with John uh, being confronted by the risen Christ, and, and the, the risen Christ is not what John remembered. But the Bible says when John, when John uh, uh, heard the voice of God, it doesn't imply that he turned around immediately. He just heard the voice of God, and he recognized it from when he walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And as he stood with Mary at the cross, hearing the instructions of Jesus that, that uh, Mary would be uh, taken care of by John. And John done that at Ephesus and took care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, until she passed away at Ephesus and, and was buried. But John burst on the scene after Mary's uh, death when his responsibility to take care of Jesus' mother had been completed. He burst on the scene because the love of God. He's the disciple that laid his head on Jesus' breast as they had the Lord's Supper. He's the one that called himself all through his gospel, the Beloved. The beloved, that's a, ter that's, a, that's a tremendous statement, the beloved, that you can declare that you're the beloved of Christ. You know, if you really know God, 
and you really know his voice and you know that he's keeping his word over us. And he says that, that if we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the one sent to pay the sin debt, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we can be saved. Amen. Being saved means that our sins are forgiven. It means that the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the life of the world, is applied to us. And we have uh, the, the Spirit of God uh, raised up in us that we might be new creations in Christ. And if you've been born again, you, you won't want to not be in association with God. Huh? If you've been born again, you'll want to know all there is to know about what is available to you. Because there's a, there's a tremendous amount of God's promises that he's given unto us. There's a tremendous amount that he's given to us. And we're joint heirs with him. He says that the things that I did in the Gospels, the three synoptic gospels and then the gospel of John is uh, uh, representing Christ as deity and explaining that, that he is he's the son of God, he is God, he's the flesh, he's the God man that came and died in our place. He's the God man that died in our place. You know, if that was, uh, if that was all there was to it, you know, we wouldn't be in the position that we are now. You know, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, it, it talks about uh, uh, Christ opened the sixth seal. Read it, Freddie. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. I bet the people in Turkey really could respond to that great earthquake. There's still earthquakes over there and in Syria. I bet the people in, in, in Palestine, uh, Ohio, can understand the black plume smoke that rose up and hid the sun up there and is, is taking out people as we speak right now here in America because there's an attack on the world by an antichrist system that wants to destroy uh, at least 90% of the world population right now. There's an attack on the world that, that's been going on since 2019 when it began with the pandemic or plandemic. And, and, and so here we are, uh, we're just coasting along. But I want to tell you something, to know God in the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection is life and life more abundantly. In, uh, in the Old Testament, there's 2,300, let's see, uh, 23,210 verses, 6,641 have predictive material in it. This is uh, in the Old Testament alone. I'll read it again. 23,210 verses and 6,641 6, have predictive material. That's in the Old Testament. That's 20, 28 and a half percent of the Old Testament has predictive material in it, and it's God's Word. You know what predictive material means? It means that God said this is going to happen, and it's going to happen, and it's all through the Old Testament. 28 percent of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there's there's 7,914 verses and 1,711 have uh, prophetic material in it. In the New Testament, it has 7,914 verses out of which 1,711 have, have prophetic material in it. That's 21.5%. Of the New Testament is predictive material. Predictive material. In the New Testament, 1800 deal with Jesus' second coming. In the New Testament, 1800 verses in the, in the New Testament deal with the second coming of Christ.
31,000 verses, 8,300 predictive verses, material in the Old Testament, in the Bible. So that means that every fourth verse in the Bible is predictive prophetic material. Now, isn't that astounding that, that the Bible includes that much predictive material? Hmm? New Testament the, deals with it and calls it the day of the Lord. One-fourth of the New Testament is judgment. You know what we're talking about here? We're talking about a Bible that tells you the love of God that passes all understanding, a love that he put on himself because he fell in love with us, not that we fell in love with him. He loved us so much that he humbled himself as God and became, uh, became a man that he could pay the debt of, of humanity that disobeyed him and the, and the judgment was already, uh, already projected before Adam and Eve every, ever did take the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This was prior to that, making it preemptive material. And yet, they rejected the knowledge of God. They rejected the knowledge of God and came under judgment. I mean, this is all the predictive prophetic word of God is judgment. Why? Because our hearts refuse to turn to the one that loves us so much. I mean, that's a love that is pure love. God has a love for man that he created in his own image like a mother and father should have for a child. Amen? Amen. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. You know, the story goes, Jesus said, Jesus said he'll have mercy on who he will have mercy on. Jesus determines Jesus determines who goes up and who's going down. Jesus Christ does. He determines it, not us ourselves. He gives us the instruction book, and he says that he watches over his word to perform it, and his word says that he took on a sin the, the sins of the world and purged it with his own blood. Doesn't mean everybody is forgiven of their sins because our part is to receive it. And when we receive the love of God and we taste of the goodness of God, taste of the goodness of God, and we, and we turn from it, then, then we're trodden under our feet the word of God. We're trodden under our feet the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out for us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Jesus paid the sin debt. The rest is up to you. Amen. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Satan is an adversary of the devil. I mean of, of God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the devil is in a fight with God. Nowhere does it say that. God's not in a fight with the devil. The fight is ours. The choice is ours. The word of God is kept for 
for our sake that we might desire the gifts of God to be joint heirs with Christ Jesus that he, that he purged the world of sin if we want to be purged and we want to be born of God. John came on the scene as the, the, the gospel writer, the four gospels is the writer the writers of the disciples and those that are talking of God, Paul, uh, uh, John Mark was uh, set at the feet of Jesus. He was the the, the nephew of, uh, of Barnabas. He was the son of Mary that owned the house the upper room was in. So when he 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 turned around from going with Barnabas and Paul to the gospel to the to the evangelistic field, he turned because he was afraid. He was afraid of what the world could do to him. And now here we stand afraid of, of our own shadow because we're, we're, we're recipients of the grace and the mercy of God. And we don't declare it over ourselves because we believe the devil over God. We believe the devil over God. Are you truly born again? Do you truly know God? Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 through 20, Freddie. I was telling Joel, this is Joel Hodge, Jeff Hodge over here. <laughs> this is Joel. Uh, we met him over when we do Preacher Bob's ministry over at uh, St. Uh, John's Lutheran Church over there. We uh, Kathy usually tries to get the last Thursday of the month because she knows that they run out of money about that time. And so she wants them to have a good meal and, and have some, some interaction with some people and have a word from God. And so Kathy usually does that each month. And we met Joel over there, uh, the the... The directors of the ministry that are there now, Paul and John and uh, others that are over that, they've encur they encouraged me that Joel is uh, on fire for God. But he lives there among them. He lives there among them by choice. Somebody has to show them the love of God. Amen. Somebody has to show you the love of God. The world today is not showing the love of God much, you know, because the the love of God. I mean, it, it takes a little bit of uh, of effort to to separate yourself from a lost and dying world. It takes somebody to say you're better than that. You're creating the image of Almighty God. You're joint heirs with Christ. And let me tell you this. God created everything for you with you in mind. And he wants to give it to you. It's a free gift. But you see, the thing of it is God will not give you something that will separate you from him. God won't do that. The devil will. The devil will give you all kinds of things to separate you from God. You've been a recipient of that, and I have too. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. But the gifts of God are, are peace, joy. Like uh, uh, Corey, the little kid, sick as he is, he's still got a smile on his face. Huh? Colton, I mean. Colton. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 through 20 is, is the description of Christ. When John turns around, he sees Christ. He's not the Christ. It's not the image that he remembers when he saw Jesus go up in a cloud from the Mount of Olives. It's not the image of that. And, and we need to get this image out of our head that, that, that Jesus is that, that humble person that allowed himself to be crucified on a cross and put to death. 
You know, Colossians says that, that, that God never turned his back on. That's a popular uh, message that God turned his back on Jesus because he couldn't look on sin. But Jesus himself in the garden in John 17 says that God will never leave him or forsake him. The Bible in Colossians says that, that God was in Jesus Christ when he was hanging on the cross. God was in Jesus Christ when he was hanging on the cross. You know what he was doing in him when he was hanging on the cross? He was reconciling the world unto God himself. He was reconciling the world into preached a sermon on the cherubims last week, and I didn't get finished, but all through Hebrews, it talks about, uh, about the cherubims and everything. But when Jesus, uh, in Matthew 27, when Jesus said it's finished, the veil that had all the, uh, all the cherubims patterns put on the veil, whenever it was rent from top to the bottom, the, the, the God removed the cherubims that had flaming swords that kept the people People, the descendants of Adam out of the sanctuary of God. It was removed right there, and the Bible says that we can go before God boldly in Christ Jesus because He loves us. Because He loves us. Because He gave Himself. For us. He gave himself for you. You ain't going to find no love like that. You're not going to find nobody that will love you like Jesus will love you. And he's watching over his word to perform it. What delivers you from the judgment that we talked about a while ago? How many times that had predictive verses in it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, predictive uh, prophetic word material that, that declared God's judgment on the world. And then when it's all said and done, after the millennial reign, it says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth because the old things will pass away. But guess what? We're going to move from the old earth to the new earth if we're in Christ Jesus, if we're born of God, if he's living in us, if he's that river of life, that, that, that gives us the, the purification and the purging of our consciences and our hearts that, that we might be sons and daughters of God. You know, it says those that follow God are called the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. It says those that follow him are the sons of God and the daughters of God. Are you following him that close? If you're not following him that close, you might be too far away to hear the trumpet sound. You might be too far away to hear the trumpet sound, but don't be discouraged because there's going to be a multitude that are unnumerable that are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ after the rapture of the bride. 144,000 Jews are going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first three and a half years. Two witnesses are going to be in Jerusalem at the Western Wall preaching Jesus Christ, the Son of God, preaching it to the world as the Antichrist erects the temple on the Temple Mount and then on the three and a half year point steps into the temple and becomes pseudo Christ. You see, that's what's going to deceive the world. He's going to become pseudo-Christ. Pseudo means one that pretends to be. Antichrist is not a right translation. Antichrist means he's against Christ. But the, the pseudo-Christ definition in the Greek means that he's going to pretend to be Christ. And that's how he's going to deceive the world. He's going to be able to do miracles 
It's what the Bible says. It's going to be able to call fire out of the sky like Elijah did. He's going to be able to do all them things to deceive those that don't know the voice of God. John knew who was, who was standing behind him. But whenever he turned around, did you read that, Freddie? No. Go ahead. When he turned around, this is what he saw. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And seven golden candlesticks are talking about the church. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he said, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of, of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden, golden, golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Seven churches. Gentiles. That's what this is addressing, the Gentile world. Candlesticks are the, are the, are the churches, representation of the churches. The seven stars are the representation of the angels that are assigned over the churches in, in Turkey. There's angels assigned to his word. He's watching over his word to perform it. And he's ready to raise you up at a time such as this that you won't be standing in judgment along with all the predictive uh, uh, material that, that the whole Bible covers because you have the choice today. You might not have the choice tomorrow. This is the day of salvation, he says. Why don't you turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 is this depiction right here. Matthew 27. It's, uh, it's, it's what uh, Hebrews, chapter, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse uh, 20 says. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20 talks about this picture right here. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews is, is talking about this picture here because the flesh is the veil. The flesh is the veil. When Jesus rose from the dead, after he had went into the bowels of the earth and took the keys from death and hell from, from Lucifer, he arose again on the, on the third day to, to, uh, to teach and ascend in, on the 40th day. Amen? Amen? All right, Freddie, go ahead and read verse 50 through 53. Jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Remember the cherubims? Remember the blue uh, thread that, that they uh, embroidered the cherubims on the veil in the tabernacle in the wilderness? Remember that? That was in Exodus chapter 25, Exodus chapter 26 is the instructions to build the veil that, that separated the holy of holies that, that kept everyone from going to the mercy seat. Remember last week we were talking about that veil being torn and it opening up the way to the sanctuary which was closed when Adam and Eve was escorted out of the garden. The holy place, the, the place that is in the midst of the earth, raised above the earth, the, the holy sanctuary of God is where this was. 
You see, that's where God took Moses to whenever he instructed him how to build the tabernacle, behind the cherubims, in the cherubims. That's why he instructed Moses to have the cherubims placed all across the veil. And when Jesus said here in Matthew 27, it, it is finished, see what happens there, Freddie. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. From the top the to earth. the bottom means that God tore the veil. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the earth graves. Quakes. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints. And the graves were opened. And many of the what? Rose? Saints. Which many of the saints rose and many came. of the many of the saints rose from from where the unseen realm michael heiser passed away this this past week michael heiser was a a a, a scholar in the bible he was a professor at one of the colleges he was a professor at one of the colleges, and, and, and you know, at Harvard University, the, the director about 20, 25 years ago, the director was married to a woman, and, and when they got married, they, they you know, they, they were trying to have children, and so this, this, uh, this man and woman uh, that were heads of the, the college at Harvard University this lady found out that she couldn't have children. But they wanted to serve God with all their might, and so uh, it didn't take her long to figure out that God intended her for, to, to, for her to adopt children. And so here, here was their goal. They, they wasn't called to adopt the prettiest kids in the orphanage. They weren't called to do that. She knew that wasn't her mission was to just adopt children. She was commissioned to adopt children that nobody wanted. That had health problems and, and, and had uh, issues with, with them, but they were children in an orphanage. And so she adopted 11 children pretty quick. She went to orphanage after orphanage and, and found the, the, the children that the, the doctors and the nurses said they ain't going to make it. They just maybe live a couple of years. And she, she determined that and told the social worker at the, at the orphanage, she said, said the, the, the director tried to discourage her from adopting this one child. And she said, this child is, is predicted to only live two years. And she told that, that, that director, she said, and God told me to make this the happiest two years of her life. God gave her the commission to make that child that only had two years to live the happiest child that, that, that she could ever be. And that was her goal. And then one day she went into the orphanage, and, and when she walked in the door with the director uh, that had, you know, brought in the, the child that had, you know, two years to live. And, and so when she walked in the door and, and, and the group of children was there, there was a little girl in a wheelchair. There was a paraplegic, and, and, and the child had never moved more than inch of any part of her body at any time in her life and this child was sitting over there and all of a sudden when she walked in the door this child in a wheelchair they caught eyes together and that child wiggled and smiled wiggled and smiled and that woman looked at that child and she said, God has said to me that I need to take and adopt this little girl that had never moved more than an inch in her life. And, and, and they predicted she wasn't going to live very much longer. It was at the main part of her, the end of her life. And she was 13 years old. And, and the lady said, no, I'm taking her home with me. 
And God told me when I looked at her eyes that that was going to be my mission, that every day I was going to make her smile like she smiled at me when I first saw her. And she'd never smiled before. It shocked the social worker that she even moved and responded to this lady coming in the room. God doesn't call us to do the easy things. God doesn't call us to, to be common, normal saints. God calls us to be supernatural saints. Amen. God calls us to be water-walking saints. Amen. Didn't God say, come to Peter, and Peter walked on the water? God's called us for a greater calling than we've ever experienced. Amen. Are we willing to do the work? Are we willing to put the devil under our feet? The devil is not God's battle. The devil is your battle. The devil is my battle. I ain't going to take it. I'm going to be all God wants me to be if I can. And I know I'll fall short of it. But it's my goal to be the best man I can be to serve God with all my heart, not because I love him, but because he loves me. Amen. Huh? Come on, church. Amen. I'm going to tell you, what's the reward of it? You, what's the destiny of those that are committed to serve God and to know God on a daily basis and understand that he, he watches over his word to keep it? Amen. What's the destiny of it? Listen to what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. Many of the saints rose from the dead with Christ when he rose. Amen. Finished reading that. He came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Peter, the storm's raging. You're, you're scared you're going to drown out here in the Sea of Galilee. But you see something on the water, even though the storm's raging. Uh, you see him out there. All the disciples are scared. And they say, Lord, is it you? And Peter said, if it be you, Lord, command me or speak to me to come out on the water. And Jesus said one simple word, come. When Jesus went into the bowels of the earth, took the keys from death, hell, and the grave away from Lucifer, Whenever he was to ascend back to the earth, he took and looked at all the saints that were in the bosom of Abraham and said, Come. Different elevation, isn't it? From walking on a stormy sea and the water's calm, it's a different situation to come out of there, uh, out on the water of the storm, to, the, to coming out of the bowels of the earth, coming out of the bosom of Abraham to serve God, to be with God forever. Because, because God was still showing up to walk with Adam and Eve. In the cool of the day. Remember, Jesus is not the one that quit showing up. God's not the one that quit showing up. Adam and Eve's the ones that quit showing up. Will you show up? Will you show up? Are you willing? Let's all stand. Listen to me. The ball's in your court. The ball's in your court. You can take what the Word of God says, or you can take what the world says. Hmm? Anybody watch the Super Bowl? Hmm? They're halftime with Brianna. The halftime show pinnacled in the nighttime, and it, it 
pyramid, platforms, people in white, dancers. And then at the top of the, the pyramid on that platform was Brianna dressed in red. You know what they were telling the world through their halftime program? That the horses, the horsemen of the apocalypse is going to be released immediately in our day. Could it happen today? Could it happen on maybe 311? They announced a global pandemic on 311 2020. They did a halftime show with the with the, the Saints and with the, uh, San Francisco last year. They're telling us. I mean, the signs that the, the, the world's putting out to the world is that, that the Antichrist, the pseudo-Christ, the one that's going to pretend to be Christ to deceive the world is on his way. What are you going to do about it? What, what, what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? I'm going to stand in the It's predictive grace. Those that will put their faith and trust in him and obey. You see, the thing that I said is obey. And so when we come into the house of God, when we come into the sanctuary of God, what did Jesus tell the money changers and the priests and the, the keepers of the temple? He said, my house will be a house of prayer. If there's anything I can push ever in, into your mind and in your heart is be a person of prayer. Be a person of prayer because prayer changes you till things change. Prayer may not be answered like you think it is, but prayer will change you till things change. Prayer will change you till things change. Is that right, April? Yes, and when things change, and you see the hand of God all over it, then you know it's God, don't you? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. One of the girls told me, said, said, all of a sudden, here I am homeless, and some woman comes up to me and gives me two or three hundred dollars, gives me a car to drive, gets me a job, gets me in the heaven sent home. Yeah. She's telling me all this stuff over at the Thursday night at the street ministry. She said, said, I don't even know the woman, but she just showed up in my life. Yep. And you know what she's yeah. recognizing? That God sent her an angel. Because the woman ain't asking nothing in return. Huh? And he'll do the same thing for you. He'll do everything for you that you can't do for yourself. Amen. Amen. Today is the day the Lord reads Psalms 118. The, this, is the Lord, this is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this occasion you've given us here to come together today. Lord, we pray for your blessing on everybody gathered here. Lord, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that needs prayer, needs to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, or needs anything they can't do for themselves, Lord, I pray the day be the day that things start turning around for them. Lord, I know that I can't save anybody here, but you can. And I direct everyone in this sanctuary that has need of salvation, of provision, of of, of healing, of whatever the need is that is in your wing. And I pray that they seek you with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul. 
And, Lord, if they do that, your word promises that they'll find you. They'll find you. And you'll tell them, come, follow me. Because that, that is our task, is to follow God. And the best direction is through his word. We'll give you the glory for everything you do because we ask these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay. Anybody help me pray for Edith's foot? Amen. Father, we just pray for Edith right now. We ask you to touch her foot, whatever's going on with that. Lord, you, you know what you knew her from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet when you created her in her mother's womb. Lord, you've brought her this far. And Lord, you, you've kept her all these days. And Lord, right now she's got a need for you to heal something on her foot, Lord. And we ask you to do that. By your stripes she is healed. We pray for that manifestation to be developed in her and that she'll be able to give you the glory for that healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else needs prayer? We're here to pray. The Lord's sanctuary is a place of prayer. Amen. Love y'all. Thank you for being here. Don't forget, next Saturday is movie night. Next Saturday's movie night. I think uh, Kenny said that Lysandra and him were going to start their Saturday services the 11th. On the 11th from 2 